Well, to something else completely different, and I mentioned it at the beginning of the programme, in an exclusive interview in the week that her case has come back to the Employment Tribunal, I've sat down with Maya Forstnatter. You may have heard Maya's name. She's the woman who lost her role at a company in 2019 after expressing beliefs about sex and gender. She took her case to Employment Tribunal on the basis that, amongst other claims, she had been discriminated against because of her belief. That belief is that biological sex is real, important, immutable and cannot be conflated with gender identity. Maya lost the preliminary hearing on the basis that her beliefs were not protected under the Equality Act of 2010, but she appealed and in June last year that decision was overturned. The ruling meant that gender critical beliefs are a protected philosophical belief under that Equality Act. This week, the next part of her tribunal starts and it will decide whether her employer discriminated against her because of her protected belief. Maya told me she first started posting her views on social media after the government published proposals to reform the Gender Recognition Act in England and Wales. So I started tweeting in September 2018. The first tweets I did were very, very dry. And I just said, there's a government consultation going on. You should be concerned about this. And here's something to read. Get involved. Something like that was very sort of very dry. And then I tweeted things that were in the news. So I tweeted about Karen White, the male prisoner who was put in a women's prison and sexually assaulted women. And yeah, tweeted sort of things that were in the news at the time. And and I got no response. So I had about 2000 followers who were policy people, usually up for an argument and didn't get anything. Nobody saying you shouldn't say this. This is terrible. Nobody agreeing with me, nothing. And so I decided I wanted to see if I could ask a question that would get people to engage with this in their personal life. And at that time, the FT gave this award for women in business, 100 top women in business. And they included in that award someone called Philip Bunce, who works at Credit Suisse, uh, the bank. And Philip Bunce goes to work some days in a wig and a dress and uses the name Pips. But Philip Bunce is a is a man. He doesn't identify as a woman. Of course, Philip Bunce isn't here, but yes, no, that's your but this, well, and, understanding and this, of this. This was, in, this was in the papers and so on. But, I mean, he, he has said that he doesn't identify as a woman. And so there was quite a lot of anger at the FT giving an award to a man for being a woman in business. And so I tweeted a question to my followers, mainly people working in think tanks and international development. A lot of the men have said... They won't be on a panel at a conference if it's a if it's a manal. It's all men. They'll say to the conference organizer, "Can't you find a woman who knows something about this topic?" And so I asked the question: If you've taken this pledge not to be on a manal, and you were, were invited to be on a panel with two guys and Philip Bunce or Pips Bunce, depending on the day, would you still see that as a manal? And would you say there are no women on this panel? as a way of getting people to think about this, not as being a distant thing, you know, not being something for a government minister or prisons policy or the Olympic Committee to work out, but something that everyone has got an idea of what a man or a woman is. And when it comes to men who've made a pledge to do something for women, do they still carry that through? Well, that's a pretty poor example if he doesn't identify as a woman. Well, well, exactly, but he had... No, I meant from your choice of trying to make it real and also (laughs) lots of people don't ever go on a panel or go anywhere near these sorts of events. That's true, but he works for Credit Suisse, so, you know, he he does go on on panels. But it was more... I mean, it was something that kind of... It was was, provocative, wasn't it? It was, and there were... But there were people talking about this particular example that that day. It it was around. Yes, and so I thought I'd just use that as a conversation starter to say... to, To try and understand what people think Mm. the definition of a woman is and whether people think that definition should be broadened when it comes to things that are put in place for the benefit of women. So obviously the Manals example is quite lightweight, but, you know, single sex services, women's spaces, women's refuges, programmes for women in terms of prizes or things for getting women into universities and leadership and so on. In all of these areas, does woman mean adult human female or does it mean something else? So so you, you were trying to elicit debate yes. and get people's views on that because some staff at the company, at the think tank uh, that you're associated with, were said to have found your tweets offensive, transphobic. What do you say to that? I think if you define 
transphobia as not believing that a trans woman is a woman. So a man who identifies as a woman, are they, is that the same as being a woman? If you disagree with that, that's transphobia. Then you will say that what I said, however reasonably I said it, was transphobia. I mean, I don't know if everybody would say that the way you said all of your tweets is reasonable. Um, That's another thing about Twitter, tone, perception, all of that. Um, You do tweet quite a lot, don't you? Um, Yes, I do. I I mean, I did before I started tweeting about this. And really, since I launched my case, you know, I've sort of tweeted more about this and and obviously less about what I was tweeting about before. Perhaps we'll also come to that. But for instance, one of the tweets, a man's feeling that he is a woman has no basis in material reality. That's one of the ones that's been mentioned. Yes. So I think being a woman means adult human female. And so their feeling isn't based on material reality. It doesn't mean it's not their feeling and their their feeling isn't important. But the material reality of being a woman, of being female, is an important concept not to give away. But just what I actually read there, a man's feeling that, that they're a woman has no basis in material reality. That's not actually you talking about sex per se there. That's about gender identity or certainly could be misconstrued as. No, I think it's about sex. I think being a woman is about sex. No, no, I know you think that, but sorry, what you actually wrote, which is what this is also going to come down to, how you are expressing yourself, not necessarily what you believe, because you've had a a victory from your point of view on that front. Half a victory. <laughs> okay, but but yes. my point is that right to have that view, um, which we'll also come to. But that, those particular words, can you see why some would say that's not you talking about sex? That's you potentially talking about the fact that if you have gender dysphoria, if you feel a certain way about yourself, not your sex, your gender identity, you're denying that. I think it comes down to the basic question of what does the word woman mean? Does the word woman mean adult human female? Or does it mean gender identity? No, it comes down to what you're trying to say in particular tweets, actually, in these in this case. This is what you know, you've gone to court over it. So I suppose, do you understand why some people would find that particular tweet transphobic, not for the reason you defined before? Because it's not about sex, that particular tweet. It's about gender identity, you could argue. But I don't I wasn't talking about gender identity, I was talking about sex. I was talking about being a woman, which is a sex. So, but but I, fact that I'm just I was, using your words. I suppose I'm looking but, at your words and trying to understand why some people may, who worked with you, have thought it was transphobic for a different reason than the way you well, than I, the way you define transphobia. I I was trying to start a discussion about the difference between sex and the idea of gender identity. Sex is a material reality, and gender identity is an idea. As you keep saying, but some of your tweets don't say that. That's the issue that I'm trying to point out for some people. Sure, but individual tweets are part of a conversation. If you take one tweet out of a conversation, and you take half a a tweet, and you say, that's offensive, um, you know, you could do that with our conversation right now. But I think what's really offensive to people is the idea that I don't agree that trans women are women. I don't agree with that. It's not about the particular words. The tribunal case that we're talking about, the the first part of this, looked at your tweets over a particular period. um, And you did go on after initially losing that preliminary tribunal to have that verdict overturned. But it was very, very clear. We'll come back to, to your take on that in just a moment. But It was very clear in that judgment that it doesn't mean that those with gender critical beliefs, as it's become known, can misgender trans persons with impunity. And what I wanted to ask you was, do you accept that there is a difference between holding a belief and the way in which it's expressed? There's quite a lot to unpack there. Um, yes, there is, there is definitely a difference. The preliminary hearing was not to look at specific tweets. It was to look at my belief and is my belief covered as a philosophical belief under the Equality Act. So the tweets were looked at um, as kind of examples of me expressing the belief. And in the tribunal that's coming up this week, they will look in much more detail at the specific tweets as manifestations of that belief. And one of the things that they will have to test is whether those manifestations were reasonable. So, But do you accept that distinction? There is a difference between holding a belief and the way you express it. Oh, absolutely. So do you see why some people and why... For instance, the Centre for Global Development, who you you know you're you're facing in a legal proceeding, would say some of what they've said. For instance, in their statement to us, uh, if I go to Amanda Glassman, the chief executive of of that think tank, uh, 
release the following statement in, in advance of the next stage of your tribunal proceedings, which have just begun. The Centre for Global Development always aims to maintain a workplace and an environment that's welcoming, safe and inclusive to all, including trans people. As these proceedings will make clear, the decision to not renew Maya Forstatter's unpaid affiliation was the result of a lengthy and carefully considered process and allowed us to remain true to our commitment to an inclusive workplace. The Centre for Global Development values and has always fostered an environment of intellectual debate and differences of view, but we strongly believe that this debate must be grounded in mutual respect and that all people must be treated with dignity. Dignity, some of those tweets, I could go to more, there's been more since, they're not going to be subject to this. Do you think you tweet with dignity and about those that you're talking about with dignity? Yes, I do. Even though, for instance, with the one that we've just talked about, some people would say that's not, that's denying people's feelings, not about sex, but about gender identity. I didn't tweet about gender identity. I tweeted about sex. Being a woman is a sex. I'm not denying that that's your view, but I'm trying to say, OK, if we look at a tweet that's not covered in this period, you tweeted in 2020, many trans men have a cervix is a much more politically palatable point than many trans women have a penis. And women are not a homogenous group, nor are men. Men can't become women or stop being men by saying so, by changing their clothes or even modifying parts of their body. Let's stop pretending they can. It's still your belief at the heart of that that you're talking about, about sex. But the way that you put those views out there, do you ever have any regrets about the way you express yourself because that's what's if you like on on trial here well well that i mean that's the big question for the tribunal is whether it is about particular words or particular ways that I express myself or whether it's about the belief itself the tweet that you've read out as i said being a woman means being female being a man means being male you can't change from one to the other um, you don't just keep tweeting that, though. That's my point. You, you find other words. Everybody does. You tweet a lot uh, and, you know, you tweet only largely about this subject at the moment, as many campaigners would do. That's what you've, you've ended up becoming, if I can yes. define you as yep. such. Do you accept that there are, at times, better ways to express yourself that don't deny some people's experience with regards to gender I, identity? I, I don't think it's about expressing yourself. I think it's about whether men can be in women's sports, whether men can be in women's prisons, whether men can be in women's refuges. and Well, it's also whether you're going to get a payout for losing your role, as far as you can see it, in this particular instance. This is what these tweets have led to, because you're, you're concerned about people losing their employment. Right, and exactly. We need to be able to talk about that, that in clear words. If we can't make a distinction between male people and women and female people, then how can we talk about whether it's fair for a male swimmer to be beating female swimmers. But you're not talking, you're tweeting. Yes. But... No, so this comes to the point of view of colleagues potentially finding you transphobic. Did you ever have any conversations with colleagues that put you in a position where you, or put them in a position, sorry, where they may think that you're transphobic? It was never raised with me. I, I can't say what other people think, but... No, no, but uh, for instance, did this top topic come up in the workplace? Because, you, you know, you looked at me in a slightly odd way when I said you're tweeting, you're not talking. You know, a lot of people would say Twitter's not often the best place to have these debates. You may differ. Um, but it, you're talking about this in the context of an employment tribunal now. I recognise you're limited with some of what you can say. But did you actually have these conversations face to face or in person on a Zoom call or something with people you worked with? Oh, it was before Zoom land. But uh, yes, I mean, I, I worked in the think tank. And so, you know, we talked about a lot of things. We talked about Brexit. We talked about Donald Trump. Um, and we talked about whether the government should change the law to gender self-ID. Not a lot, but it was something that came up in conversation. But it was mainly because I tweeted about it. OK. And do, do, do you regret any of the ways in which you've expressed yourself on this? Because that's what's at the heart of this. No, I don't. Because your, your view is protected by that ruling, but the way you've expressed yourself may still mean that your former place of work has the right to end its association with you. Do you accept that? Well, that's what the tribunal is going to be looking at. But do you accept that a place of work has the right to end its association with you if tweets you do outside of work do not comply with what they say are their ways of doing business? You don't have absolute freedom of speech at work. You know, if you work for a supermarket, you're not allowed to tell people that the competing supermarket is the best place. There, you know, there are things that your workplace can 
not allow you to do because of your job. But those things have to be reasonable. They can't um, stop you expressing a legally held view in all circumstances. And do you think you've ever been hostile or rude in any of your exchanges online that an employer could look at and think ill of? I recognise you you can see there are limits to free speech in and around this subject, because that's mainly what we're talking about. You'd have to ask somebody else who's looking at my tweets. I'm not going to, you know, say what somebody else might no, think of me. And I recognise you're in a legal proceeding, <laughs> but I suppose it's just that, do you ever take a step back from this and think, maybe I went a bit far there? No, I think... You know, my case comes in the context of hundreds of women, probably thousands of women and men, but, you know, I hear from ma- mainly from women who have been investigated at work, who have been put under pressure to keep quiet about this issue and who are anonymous on social media because of it. And people who've done things like liking a tweet by J.K. Rowling and they've been it reported and you know at the start of an investigation because of that so I really don't think it's about how I said it it's about a much wider pressure to shut people down from even expressing the mildest opinion about this if it disagrees with the idea that gender identity should replace sex. I suppose it's actually not what I'm trying to get at is whether the tone of the conversation on both sides has been conducive to getting anywhere with it. You said right at the beginning of this, I wanted to start a conversation. I wanted to hear people's views. And I I wonder if you think it's been worth it, if you think those exchanges have been meaningful, or have you just forced yourself into your own echo chamber where you're surrounded by those who agree with you? I think things have changed quite a lot from when I started tweeting about this in terms of there being a debate in the media, there being... Well, it went on the political agenda. It's, yes. It's not just, it's not just <laughs> conversations on social media, no, of course. No, exactly. But partly what I was responding to was the lack of careful, reasoned conversation. So, you know, you can't talk about this in university. We saw what happened to Kathleen Stock. I was working in a think tank. You know, those debates are not going on the kind of think tanks, the organisations, the women's sector are having these debates with fear. And that's that's not right. I mean, there are real conflicts of rights, conflicts of interest between women and trans women. And we ought to be able to talk about those. Twitter's not the ideal place to talk about them. But if there's nowhere else than Twitter, at least it starts the conversation. But I suppose just reversing that, do you think Twitter's poisoned it to the point that... You know, the, 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 those sorts of people are scared to have those conversations. You're saying some people already were, but it it is quite hostile out there. I, you you will have you will have seen it. It's hostile about lots of topics, but the the so called culture wars, which this then gets put into. I wonder if you if you feel that you could move this elsewhere now that things fr- have changed in I, a better I, way. I would definitely like to. I mean, you know, I, I've set up an organisation, Sex Matters, to do some of this work, to do the research, to do the analysis, because the established organisations were not doing that. I think uh, it's not... What people are afraid of is not hostility on Twitter. What people are afraid of is losing their jobs and harming their careers. And that happens because complaints processes within organisations get weaponized. Well, there's also those people, especially uh, those trans people, who who feel that, for instance, you know, if I look at after the ruling, the, the, the ruling which, which overturned the original one, and the LGBT Foundation gave the response uh, concerning that ruling that despite repeat references to respect to trans people, that the ruling would give licence for some to hold harmful beliefs about trans people without consequences. I suppose that's the other side well, they of believe, concern. They believe that my belief is harmful and that I should lose my job because of it. Well, let's not... Well, I don't know if they believe that you should lose your job over it, but they certainly wouldn't agree with your view. I think that's safe to say. Well, the Equality and Human Rights Commission came in on the preliminary hearing supporting the view that this belief should be protected. And the LGBT Foundation disagreed with the EHRC. They didn't think this belief should be protected. And another employment doesn't judge... Doesn't necessarily... Sorry if I to interrupt. Doesn't necessarily uh, 
make it that they believe you should lose your job over it. Well, it, it means you wouldn't have any protection against discrimination and harassment. So if you lost your job because of it, you wouldn't be able to go to tribunal. Another so, employment so you say, judge what, called you say that, one f- follows the other? Yes. It's the, they, another employment judge called it open season. You know, if you don't have protection against discrimination for your beliefs, then employers can discriminate and harass you because of your beliefs. So for people who are trying to follow this, you're now at this other stage, which is actually whether you were employed and whether you should have lost your role over it, over what you tweeted, despite your beliefs now being protected. Right. It's about whether my employer discriminated against me and harassed me because of my beliefs. Going through the court system and having the spotlight on you, how have you found that? Um, It's been like boiling a frog, you know, kind of gradual. I've got a really good legal team and the legal process itself, there's lots of high Mm. stress and then lots and lots of waiting. So all of that has been, you know, sort of quite stressful. And then obviously losing in December 2019 the initial was, yeah the initial loss was was awful what and was that like it was it was just gutting I couldn't believe that the judge had you know said that my belief is not worthy of respect in the democratic society which means it's on par with uh, Nazism and fascism when um, talking about the limits of of what we have right in, in terms of which which beliefs should not be protected it's really it's beliefs that that destroy other people's rights and that means wanting to overthrow the government by violent revolution or being a neo-nazi and the judge had put my really ordinary belief that there are two sexes and people can't change sex and said that that was on par with nazism why do you think they did that i mean he got the law wrong and that's why it was was overruled you then go back in there's quite a wait and it's overturned and how, how did you feel at that point um, yeah, that was amazing. I mean, it, that was sort of deep in lockdown. And I remember coming into London one day and feeling like there was a sort of invisible ticker tape parade. You know, I had this amazing win and I couldn't see anybody to celebrate it with for, for months and months. But it was brilliant to have it overturned. And then in the sort of months after that, I've met so many people who said to me, your judgment has made a difference to me in my job teachers, social workers, nurses, all sorts of people who, where the difference between sex and gender identity matters more practically in their job than it did to me as a think tank. And, you know, they've said this allows us to look at our policies and to say, you know, have you checked this against safeguarding? Is this right? And not feel frightened that they're going to lose their job for saying sex matters and it was also brought to more prominence with jk rowling yes so that was the day day after i lost she she tweeted and that came out the blue i didn't are you have you met her have you got a relationship not yet we've um we've dm'd you've direct message for for some of our listeners who aren't perhaps on twitter as much (laughs) as you okay and and i mean what is that relationship like of course because she's she's very high profile in all of this I don't know, fairy godmother, I suppose. I didn't know that she was watching the case. I had no contact with her before. And the day after I lost, someone messaged me a screenshot of her tweeting and I thought that they made it up to cheer me up. Um, I, You know, I just, it came out, of, came out of the blue and it's made the case much more high profile. Um, it put a lot of attention on me whereas before you know there were some people paying attention to the case but you know you had to be quite interested in it and then once it became linked to JK Rowling there were lots of people trying to discredit her for what she said and so in order to discredit her they tried to discredit me and to say that I had misgendered a trans person in in my workplace which I hadn't and I wouldn't and I didn't have any trans colleagues. Would you as it's described, mis- misgender some, or use a pronoun that they weren't using? No, I, I t- from the very start, I told... Not, not just at work, I mean generally. Um, it depends what the context is. So I told my workplace that in any professional or social setting, I would use whatever preferred pronouns that people want, and that is true. But I'd also come into conflict. I'm scout leader, and I'd had a conflict on Twitter 
with another scout leader who I've never met, who prefers to be called they, um, but who looks like a man with a beard. And I had accidentally called this person he on Twitter. And they reported me to the Scout Association, who ended up investigating me for two years, um, sort of in parallel to the Employment Tribunal. And eventually they apologised for that. But in the course of that investigation, I did say to the Scouts, if I was as a Scout leader at camp and there was somebody male in the women's showers or the girls' showers, I wouldn't stop and ask them what their pronouns were. It doesn't matter what their gender identity is. I would say there's a man in the women's showers and I would make sure that those girls and women are safe. So in some situations, respect for gender identity can't be the first thing no but you, i suppose what you what i'm seeing with even in our conversation when some of your tweets as well is you, you have a tendency when i ask you what a question or it's asked about pronouns to then take it to a violent situation a potential threat situation and i suppose it's that leap that people can also take issue with which is giving the idea that those who are trans are going to be violating people no that's not that's not what I'm saying. No, no, but I'm just saying I'm noticing in the pattern of when we're talking where you take the example to. It's the worst possible case in your mind for why you may end up in a situation. And I recognise you're, you're trying to answer the question yes. fully. But, but do you see that that leap in itself for some, even if they actually agree with you about sex, but have uh, you know their view on, on gender identity, they identify as trans, whatever, because there are obviously tran trans people who do have an issue with some of the same things that you have an issue with. We should remember that. <laughs> but th that leap in itself is offensive. I, it would be difficult otherwise to answer the question. If I answered the question, your question, and said I would never misgender somebody, you know, never not use the pronoun they wanted... I would be lying because there are some situations where I think that is justified. And well, yeah, for you know, as you describe it, if someone's in a shower that you see that they shouldn't be, but you don't have to go that far to always give to well, make your point. But, I mean, and you do that a lot in your tweets, and that's what's on the stand this week. But as as a scout leader, you're trained on safeguarding, and of safeguarding does say. I mean, you have to go to the worst possible scenario if you assume the best of everybody. But I didn't ask you about safeguarding. I asked you generally in your social life at, or work, you brought up this example, that's fair yes. enough, and, and that's part of your experience. Yes, I, I really yes. understand that. But, you know, do you understand why always reaching for what could be a violent situation or a threatening situation when asked about this is for some a worrying indication of your views on trans people? No, it's not about my views on trans people. It's about sex. You know, ninety-eight percent of it sexual assaults the, are this, carried out by men, and uh, we have to be able. You're to on Women's Hour. We're not going to debate uh, <laughs> the violence against women. I, you know, I do that pretty much every day on this program. You know, you, you're talking yes, to the converted yeah, yeah, yeah. about statistics there, but it's about the question. The question I asked you wasn't about sex. It was actually about people's preferred pronouns and your respect of that. It was about respect, really. I, I, you know, as I said, I will use people's preferred pronouns in a social situation. Yes. But where it's necessary to be explicit about somebody's sex, whether it's to do with collecting data or whether it's to do with sport or whether it's to do with crime or whether it's to do with enabling and recognising women, we have to be able to make the distinction between male and female, men and women. And, and many people will agree with you, will be you know, saying that in unison with you on the radio now. But you know, what's the impact been on your family life, your, your kind of day-to-day? -day? Yeah, it's, it's been quite stressful. Um, I wouldn't recommend anyone to go into an employment tribunal lightly. And it's not a battle that my children picked or my husband picked, but they've supported me. You say it's important. Do you regret fighting this in any way because of the toll it may have had personally? I'm not talking about your views there, just the reality of going into this. No, I don't. I think, you know, this is a really important battle and women in the UK are standing up against gender ideology in a way that hasn't really happened anywhere else and saying we need to be able to put women's rights first. We need to be able to put truth first. And that doesn't mean you can't respect transgender people's 
can't respect their dignity, um, can't figure out how to accommodate them in public life in every way and protect them from discrimination and harassment. But you have to be able to talk about material reality. Um, so I'm, I'm quite proud that I'm part of this and I'm really proud of what's going on in the UK. Maya Forstutter, who's in the middle of that uh, second part of her case, and of course will keep up to date with that case.